Welcome to the 2020 NCAA Baseball Rules and Officiating Video. My name is George Struchus, NCAA National Coordinator of Umpires. It is my humble privilege to be of service to the great game of college baseball and work with the coaching and umpiring communities. During this 2020 NCAA Rules and Officiating Video, the NCAA Baseball Umpire Program will be reviewing approved rule changes and interpretations effective for the 2020 season and their impact and how the game is to be officiated. We will be reviewing plays in response to the NCAA Baseball Rules Committee's continual effort to write rules that are enforceable for umpires. Please note that the NCAA Baseball Umpire Program is responsible for this script and that no attempt was made by the Baseball Umpire Program to embarrass any institution, coach, student athlete, or umpire. All clips herein are used for instruction and making officiating better. The goal of this video is to develop a national style of officiating that will result in a consistent enforcement of the rules during non-conference, conference, and championship play. Stakeholders desire to have plays officiated in the same manner no matter the conference, division, or geographic region that the game is played in this great country. Throughout the 2020 baseball season, we will continue this effort with periodic video bulletins posted on the NCAA baseball website on arbitersports.com. It is my sincere hope that all coaches, administrators, and umpires will make it a habit to view these bulletins regularly. As we begin this video, it is very important for the NCAA baseball umpire program to acknowledge and congratulate the coaches, coordinators, and umpires on a truly exceptional 2019 season. Thank you for your efforts to improve the game we all love. Finally, I would like to recognize Tom Heiler for his assistance with the video. Hello, I'm Randy Bruns, the NCAA Baseball Secretary Rules Editor. 2019 was a historic year for college baseball with the implementation of several significant rules changes that were needed to keep our game competitive and up to date. The start of the 2020 season brings a couple of additional changes that focus on player safety and pace of play. The purpose of this video will be to review those rules and points of emphasis that the NCAA Baseball Rules Committee feels are most important. Whether your role is as a coach, player, or umpire, I encourage you to use all the resources available to learn more about the rules as you prepare for the coming season. Two regulations about bats that were passed by the Rules Committee in 2017 take effect beginning with the 2020 season. These changes were communicated prior to the 2018 season. Beginning this season in all divisions, the barrel of any bat used in competition must be of a color predominantly contrasting with the color of the ball. A list of bats that no longer meet this playing rule can be found on the Baseball Playing Rules page on NCAA.org. Also, starting this spring in the 2020 season, bat barrel compression testing becomes mandatory prior to each regular season series or single date of competition for Division I. Bat testing will be mandatory for Divisions 2 II and 3 starting with the 2021 season. Beginning this year, it is recommended that all catcher's chest protectors be certified to the NOXI Commotio Cordis Protective Device Standard at the time of manufacture and bear the manufacturer's certification indicating satisfaction of the NOXI and SEI testing standards. If a certified chest protector is not worn, it is recommended that the catcher wear under the chest protector an alternative protective device certified to the Noxy Commotio Cordis Protective Device Standard at the time of manufacture. This rule is applicable for Divisions 1, 2, II, and 3 and is a recommendation for 2020. This certification will be required effective January 1, 2021 for all three divisions. One of last season's major changes dealt with the handling of charge conferences for both the defense and the offense. Teams adjusted well to this change, which allows a number of opportunities to discuss strategy without too many delays that can slow down the pace of the game.
Remember, a charged conference generally occurs when a coach or player leaves their position to communicate with a teammate. The defense is allowed a total of six charged conferences without a pitching change during a regulation game, plus one additional charged conference in any extra inning game. A coach can be involved in no more than three of those during regulation, but can be involved with the extra conference allowed during extra innings. If a player attempts a conference after the team's limit has been reached, the request will be refused. Brief incidental communications during play that do not delay the game are not considered charged conferences. Note that a pitching change is only required when a coach is involved with a defensive conference in the following situations. A second trip to the same pitcher in the same inning. Another trip after a coach has been involved with three charged conferences during regulation and a trip after a team has used all of their allotted conferences. Remember, if the batter or any base runners leave their positions to confer with coaches or other players during a charged defensive conference, they must use one of their three offensive charged conferences. If the defensive team makes a pitching change, this is not a charged conference and the offense may meet, but must be back to their positions prior to the last warm-up pitch so the game can be started promptly. The hit-by-pitch rule was changed last season to allow a batter to be awarded first base when he freezes and is hit by a pitch within the batter's box. The rule change also awards a strike as an additional penalty for making a movement to intentionally get hit by the pitch. Umpires are reminded that if a batter is hit by a pitch within the batter's box and if there's any doubt about whether a batter moved intentionally to get hit, he should be awarded first base. The change did have the desired effect of reducing the number of times that batters were intentionally trying to get hit by a pitch. The judgment of a hit-by-pitch situation is considered the same type of decision as a ball, strike, or checked swing and cannot be argued. By rule, a coach would be ejected in this situation if he leaves his position to argue a hit-by-pitch decision. No warning is warranted. However, if video review is being utilized, a head coach could use one of his two challenges to have this hit-by-pitch situation reviewed. The goal of this rule is to discourage the practice of intentionally moving to get hit by a pitch or allowing a pitch that is not within the batter's box to hit the batter. If the batter had no opportunity to avoid being hit, he should be awarded first base. The position of the feet prior to starting a windup or a set is a key component of a legal position. Last year's rule changes were more specific about the location of the feet prior to the delivery of a pitch. Review the components that make up a legal windup or set position. Remember, especially that in NCAA baseball, after assuming a windup or set position, any natural movement associated with the pitch commits the pitcher to pitch without alteration or interruption. The only exception is a pitcher may pause slightly during a delivery from a windup position without penalty. This is not allowed when pitching from a set position. A pitcher can slow down or speed up his natural delivery as long as he does not make a quick pitch or alter his delivery by some action such as pumping his leg up and down. Wind-up position, the free or non-pivot foot, must be placed behind or breaking the plane of the front edge of the pitcher's plate. Other requirements remain the same as in the past. As a reminder, only one forward step can be taken during the actual delivery of the pitch. An initial sideward or backward step can be taken to start the delivery, but the pitcher cannot step forward to start the motion, then lean back and take another step forward in the delivery of the pitch. The initial position when using the set position must now be established with the pivot foot in contact with and parallel to the pitcher's plate and the free foot clearly in front of the rubber. The shoulders should be facing the respective foul line when the pitcher brings his hands together when coming set before the delivery of the pitch. 
The penalty for using an illegal position is an illegal pitch with no runners on base and a balk when runners are on base. With pace of play being a continuing concern and point of emphasis, it is critical that the timing of intervals between pitches and between innings be measured and enforced consistently. Too often, these rules have been ignored or used as loosely monitored guidelines. A visible clock can be used so that these time frames are obvious to all the participants and any penalties can be more consistently enforced. However, even if a visible clock is not available and the time limits are being monitored by a base umpire, the expectation is that the timing rules be enforced throughout every game. Last season, the wording of how to time the interval between innings was rewritten for more consistency. This year, the 20-second pitch clock limit that formerly applied only to situations where there were no base runners was expanded to include situations when runners were on base. Let's look at the guidelines used to administer this new rule. The 120-second time limit between innings begins when the defensive players start to leave their positions following the last out of the inning and stops when the plate umpire puts the ball in play for the first pitch of the next half inning. The pitcher must be ready to pitch, holding the ball and touching the pitcher's rubber, and the batter must be in the batter's box and ready to hit within the 120-second time limit. If the offensive team is not ready, a strike is called on the first batter. If the defense is not ready, a ball is awarded to the first batter. For the first pitch of each half inning, the 20-second time limit begins when the umpire puts the ball in play and ends when the pitcher begins the motion associated with the start of the pitch. For each subsequent pitch, when the ball remains alive, the interval begins when the pitcher receives the ball on the mound, the catcher is in the catcher's box, and the batter is in the batter's box. If an umpire calls time or if the ball becomes dead, for example, after a foul ball or a pickoff attempt that goes out of play, the timer shall start when the umpire signals play after the pitcher engages the rubber with possession of the ball, the catcher is in the catcher's box, and the batter assumes his position in the batter's box. The timer stops and resets to 20 seconds under the following circumstances. The pitcher begins his windup or motion to come set. The pitcher makes a pickoff attempt at any base. The pitcher feints a pickoff attempt or steps off the rubber with runners on base. The clock will reset and restart immediately. The catcher leaves the catcher's box to give defensive signals or to confer with the pitcher and will start when he returns to the catcher's box. The umpire calls time. If the pitcher violates the time limit, he shall be warned by the umpire. Each pitcher receives one warning. For any additional violations by that pitcher, the ball is dead and a ball is awarded to the batter. If the batter is at fault by not being in his position in the batter's box and alert to the pitcher with at least five seconds remaining in the time limit, the umpire will award a strike. The ball is dead and no runners may advance. If the catcher or other defensive player intentionally delays getting the ball to the pitcher on the mound so that the time limit doesn't start, or if the pitcher delays taking his position on the mound, the plate umpire may point to have the 20-second time limit started. A new point of emphasis for the 2020 season is the legality of bats. Bat barrel compression testing is mandated for this season in Division I and next season for Divisions II and III. Coaches should make sure that all bat models being used in games are on the approved list and that they have not become illegal due to use. This includes ensuring there are no dents, no rattles, and no excess pine tar. Coaches must then confirm at the pregame conference that all playing equipment meets NCAA rules and regulations. The enforcement of running lane interference continues to be one of the points of emphasis for the coming season. Video continues to show that after a bunt or chopper in front of home plate, 
Runners are often not running within the running lane during the last half of the distance to first base, potentially interfering with the completion of any play at first base. Special attention needs to be placed on this rule in fairness to the defense. See Rule 711P. The batter runner is running outside the three-foot running lane if either foot is outside either line. The batter runner may exit the running lane on his last stride or step to reach first base if he has been running legally within the running lane up to that point. If he is running illegally to first base and his being outside the lane alters the throw of a fielder, hinders or alters a fielder's opportunity to field the throw, or if the batter runner is hit by the throw, it is interference and the batter runner is out. Note that being hit by the throw is not required for interference to occur. Umpires must be aware if the batter runner has been running legally within the lane during the last half of the distance from home plate to first base. The final points of emphasis remain pace of play and coach-player-umpire interactions. The responsibility to make our sport an enjoyable one to play and to watch and to continue to improve the professionalism of interactions between any of the game's participants is shared by all of us who have responsibilities for the great game of college baseball. Thank you for all that you do for the game of college baseball and best wishes for a great season in 2020. America's pastime has a long and storied history and every part of that history includes the umpires that make the games possible. There is an officiating shortage in virtually every part of the country. Many NCAA umpires played college baseball and have found officiating to be a wonderful avocation. Coaches, please encourage your student athletes to consider officiating baseball once their playing career ends. Expanded video review was used in the Atlantic Coast, Big 12, and Southeastern Conferences, with the SEC using centralized video review for conference games. 17 of 29 conferences used video review in their conference tournaments. For the first time, centralized video review was implemented within the regional round of the 2019 NCAA Division I Baseball Championship. Review officials at the NCAA Command Center conducted 168 reviews during the 123 regional and super regional tournament games. Centralized video review was also used at the College World Series where 19 plays were reviewed during the 15 games played. Of the 187 reviews during the Division I Baseball Championship, 142 were initiated by Coach Challenge. 93 of the 142 Coach Challenges were related to force and tag plays at any base. Of the 187 total video reviews, 111 reviews were confirmed, 39 reviews stood as called, and 37 video reviews were overturned by the centralized video review officials. During the 2019 NCAA Division I Baseball Championship, there were an average of 1.5 reviews per game. There were 101 games with at least one review and 37 games had no reviews. The average length of review was 1 minute 15 seconds. <music> Baseball is unique, historically, that a head coach is allowed to come onto the field and according to the 2019 and 2020 NCAA Baseball Rules Book Code of Conduct section, which specifically states that coaches must confine their discussion with game officials to the interpretation of the rules and not challenge the umpire's decision involving judgment. In 2019, the National Coordinator of Umpires received 862 NCAA Incident Ejection Suspension Reports. These included 361 Division I reports. Of this list, 178 were head coaches, 64 were assistant coaches, and 119 were student athletes. A brief categorizing of the causes for the Division I ejections includes ball strike, 156 of 361 reports, safe out, 71 of 361. All ejections are technically unsportsmanlike, with profanity reported at 90% within the incident ejection suspension reports. 
The total number of suspended games in 2019 was 339. All NCAA Division I incident ejection suspension reports were forwarded with rule reference pursuant to suspension penalty to the conference office baseball administrators as well as the conference umpire coordinator and the applicable baseball umpire program staff. This data has been a tremendous benefit for all and has led to some very unsettling trends for several years now regarding the culture of college baseball and possible resolutions. As we move to 2020, coaches, please realize the importance of civility in dealing with umpires, that you are role models to your players and coaches. But note that the responsibility to improving the relationship between head coaches, assistant coaches, team personnel, and umpires lies equally between all stakeholders. College baseball has never been in a better place. Baseball officiating has continued to evolve over the past years and in particular, the last few years have seen dramatic changes in the landscape in which officials operate. Media broadcasts have driven much of the change with increased exposure, while there are also pressures to win. Without a doubt, the pressure to win is at the root of coach-umpire relations when situations turn tense. With all that said, whether a coach or an official, when you are in control of your emotions, one can communicate in a professional manner. In this effort to reduce incidents, ejections, suspensions in 2020, you have many tools and NCAA baseball umpire program protocols at your disposal. Utilize the formal warning when possible, discipline yourself to be credible and concise in your communication, and remember your true role of managing the game. Coaches, it is very important for the integrity of our game to select officials for the championship who are adhering to the NCAA rules points of emphasis, and the NCAA baseball umpire program's protocols. We have high expectations of our officials. Finally, the question was raised by the NCAA Baseball Rules Committee as what intermediary measures could be proposed for the game of baseball that correlates with a technical foul in basketball, a 15-yard penalty in football, that will hopefully help in reducing ejections and displays of poor sportsmanship and behavior. At the conclusion of the annual NCAA Baseball Rules Committee meeting this past July, I asked John Casey, Rules Committee member and member of the American Baseball Coaches Association and NCAA Coach Umpire Relations Committee to craft a survey as a next step in pursuing an intermediary mechanism which baseball could possibly use in the hopes of decreasing the ejections and suspensions which have increased each of the past several years. We look forward to receiving the results from this survey to see if there are potential solutions. If the number of ejections and suspensions in the sport do not decrease in the upcoming season, the NCAA Baseball Rules Committee may consider some rule changes in the future to address this issue. Finally, I want to reiterate here, it is critically important for the integrity of our game to select officials for the championship who are adhering to the NCAA rules points of emphasis, and the NCAA Baseball Umpire Program's protocols. We have very high expectations of our officials. In closing, the goal of the National Coordinator of Umpires has always been to continue to grow the NCAA Baseball Umpire Program and to manage and lead the many facets of the program. An excellent, dedicated, and passionate staff assists this effort greatly. Perception and professionalism continue to be emphasized. Teaching and mentoring the NCAA way is job number one, inclusive of consistency, accuracy, and poise in our dealings on the field. The NCAA Division I Baseball Committee and the Baseball Umpire Program are committed to improving umpiring during the regular season as well as the NCAA Baseball Championship. The continued growth of college baseball makes it imperative that we strive to assign well-trained and qualified umpires to every game throughout the season. The NCAA baseball umpire policies in 2020 will serve as surety and will safeguard these directives. Wishing all the stakeholders of our great game of NCAA college baseball the very best in 2020. Thank you.